Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and it is Guy Talk Hour 2, and they got a pizza in Hour (laughs) 1, and I can clearly see their blood sugar levels are starting to drop a little bit. So if you are standing outside the studio door with a pizza, come on in. (laughs) These guys or dessert. Extremely happy. All right. I've got Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V. They will do their very best to answer whatever questions you send over. 877-933-2484. All right, gentlemen, let's get started. If I'm watching an unsaved YouTuber, so you're watching a YouTube, and it's an unsaved person, can the evil spirits that are on them somehow get on me? Or if I'm watching YouTube videos on the wrong things. Well, again, it goes back. If you're a Christian, you can be harassed. And I would say, quit looking at this stuff. It's not worth looking at if there's any concern for that. If you're not a Christian, I don't know how the demons always work, but I know this. If you expose yourself to demonic theology and demonic teaching and demonic ideas, believe me, they know how to get to your house (laughs) and they show up and all of a sudden, you know, you're thinking these things when you're not watching YouTube or you're wanting more of these things. And so I always tell people, be cautious. But for Christians, you know, I would, as soon as I run into something like that, that I know is way off, I turn it off. And then I'll be honest, guys, I take a moment and I pray for that person, but I turn it off because I can't communicate with them directly, but I know it's not right. The very fact that we're born with a conscience that God has given us and a sensitivity about these issues, hasn't it ever happened to you that you can, when you walk into a house or walk into a certain situation, you can feel the evil there? Hmm. You can feel it. Now, I understand it doesn't exist as a virus. It's not hanging there like a cloud. If you walk underneath it, you're going to be infected because it needs a host, yeah. whether it's an angel or it's a human being. But just as you were saying, Tom, as a follower of Christ, you cannot be possessed, but you can be oppressed by the enemy. So watching a video, the enemy has an opportunity to make the connection between the video and you. It is possible. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable— if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We need to be very careful as Christians uh, what entertainment choices we read, watch, and so on, and fill our minds with. So, Well, I mean, you've heard that computer phrase years ago, garbage in, garbage out. I mean, your mind, God gives you a mind where you are able to comprehend the images and the sensory inputs into, into your brain and make some sense of it. And so whatever you're bringing in, whatever you're reading, whoever you're hanging around with, whatever you're exposing yourself to, will make its way through that sensory apparatus called the brain and be able to be comprehended by the mind and ultimately gets into the transformational core you're being, which is the heart. So you have to be careful what you expose yourself to. And if you've exposed yourself and you know it and it's coming after you or you sense that, I really encourage you to talk to other Christians that you trust that can pray with you to confess it to the Lord, and sometimes these things have to be confessed multiple times. It is just it seems to creep around, and it's still there. Keep giving it over to the Lord Jesus; He knows what to do with it. Yeah, and if if you're being attacked, you shouldn't cower in fear, because what I've shared before is is that the enemy never attacks someone he's not afraid of. I have a situation right now with a young man who's going through foundations, which we call Ground Zero, which are building the foundation of his faith. And he called me the other night, and he said, I, "I'm just feeling." The, the enemy, I'm, everything is, is just not right. And I told him, I says, look, you're being attacked because he's afraid of what you're going to become. If you build a foundation of the faith, 
He knows what that's going to look like down the road, and he would rather you not have any influence over anybody, so he's going to attack somebody he's afraid of because he's ultimately afraid of you becoming his formidable foe. Because every Christian who becomes a mature Christian understanding God's word and his promises will know and understand that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Absolutely. The enemy is a defeated foe. I've read the back of the book. We win. Yeah, I, I told him, I said, he can't do anything to you for that very reason, Jeff, because he who is in you is greater than he's outside of you, and they cannot coexist in the same space. Hmm. Well, Ephesians 4 says, and do not give the devil a foothold. What does it mean to give the devil a foothold? When you sit in a repeated direction over time, all of a sudden it becomes a stronghold in your life. Okay. And it's very difficult for you to break that stronghold. That's the foothold. You're giving the enemy a beachhead okay. in which to attack you. Well and said. again, that's where many times we need one another. I mean, I've worked with a lot of men, especially, who have gotten caught in things or they've gotten that beachhead type of step and they've gotten into something. They have no clue how to get out of it. Mm-mm. And it's destroying their mind. It's destroying their spirit. It's destroying their body. And that's where I usually try to bring together two or three other men that we will pray with that person, you know, multiple times. You know, not just once a week. Sometimes we'll get together twice a week or while on the phone. Because they're in a dilemma and they need help. Sometimes all it takes is for you to say out loud that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Yeah. You know, Paul describes this as being a slave to sin. He says in Romans 6 that don't you know when you offer yourself to someone as a, in obedience, you are offering yourself as a slave either to sin or to righteousness. He goes on mm-hmm. to say, therefore, offer yourself to God. I mean, sin and addiction is this idea that you are you are submitting to its desires. You are becoming a slave to what it, how it controls over you. You know, an ever increasing desire for an ever diminishing, you know, a, a joy or appeasement, uh, and and these are you know, addictive cycles. And if you've, if you've ever dealt with any kind of addiction, you know this, you, you are slaves to that which you, are, which you obey. You and so God with, says, yeah. put that off, right, and mm-hmm. be slaves to him, to righteousness. When you play with sin and you continue to do so, it'll start to play with you and then it'll be out of your control. And know that you have been set free yeah. from sin. And that is the power that is at work in you. And... And we've got to understand that we can't just do this privately all the time. You know, the body of Christ is there, and that's why all those one another passages there, confess your sins to one another. Well, you know if you've worked with small groups, whether it's uh, Christian Alcoholics Anonymous or some of the others, there's some pretty open confession there. I believe the church should be operating that way, probably in a smaller setting, you know, like home churches, in a larger church, but we don't do enough of that. We make pronouncements. We say what the Lord wants, and you're absolutely right. I'm not disagreeing with any of this. We're absolutely right. But most people who are stepping into that stronghold have no clue how to get out of it on their own. That's right. And they need help from somebody else who will confront them in love and say, Jeff, you got to quit this, and I'm not going away till you do. I'm going to be there with you. Freedom in Christ Ministries under the direction of Neil T. Anderson was all about that. There's a point you reach in your walk if if you're in bondage. If, you're, if there's a stronghold, and Scripture actually uses the word stronghold, then sometimes, just as you're saying, time, you need somebody else to come alongside of you to help you out of that stronghold, appealing not to their own energy or their own strength, but to the, the strength of Christ. You also can't unsee certain things. So when this person talks about watching something on YouTube and can something get on you, and I think... You can see an image that is not going to leave your mind maybe ever because that's the way some of those images are. I mean, I was watching a football game last fall and all of a sudden there was a commercial during the football game for like Exorcist, you know, nine or something, some horrible, you know, sequel to this movie. And, and I I was trying to figure out what I was looking at. And all of a sudden I, it dawned on me what I was seeing and I was horrified. And yet I can still kind of see that horrible image in my head. Yeah. I didn't ask for that. Mm-mm. The interesting thing about memory is when you get older, they say you lose your memory. You're not losing your memory. Your memories are there. Your retrieval system's gotten rusty. <laughs> and, and But the memory, what you're saying, I'm half jokingly, but it's, it's the truth of what you're saying, Bill. I mean, once that's seeded there, 
It's there. That's why you continually need the grace of God, the power of God, to go ahead and, and have strength over that because it'll raise its head and the enemy will bring it to remembrance. When Gone with the Wind was released, the line, frankly, Scarlet, I don't give a damn, was controversial. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. And we've lost our societal sensitivity to language anymore. And the same thing is true with all of us. The more you expose yourself to the things that aren't excellent and praiseworthy, the less sensitive you are to those things. We should be discerners of good and evil. And and Bill, your comment, the movies today have gotten so disturbing oh. in their oh, themes weird. and their graphic. I don't know how yeah. anybody goes to any of these movies. So. And they, they call it entertainment? Yes. What? I don't get it. It's crazy. Yeah. Even Disney's gone over the deep end. It's it's everywhere. Hmm. No, good point, Tom Parrish. All right, uh, why did God not let Moses enter the promised land? Seems like he deserved to go for all he did. Oh, I love this one. Okay. Remember at the very beginning of their exodus, God tells Moses to strike the rock and mm-hmm. water will come out. And he strikes the rock and the water comes out. At the end of the 40 years... God says to speak to the rock so that water would come out. But Moses strikes the rock instead. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, he disobeyed God, so he wasn't allowed into the promised land. But I think there's actually something more. Because the New Testament tells us that who was the rock? It was Christ. And that word strike, if I use the, in the King James, it used smite, it's the same as what Isaiah 53 says that he was smitten by God. Jesus is the one that was struck. He was smitten by God. Here's a picture of Christ being smitten by God and water, living water come out, comes out. Now that Christ is crucified, now that he's been sacrificed, you don't strike the Christ again. You call on the Lord and he will answer. You ask the Lord for salvation and he will give you living water. So I think not only did Moses disobey God, I think he messed up Hmm. this picture of salvation that God was trying to show through Moses. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. He messed it up. You were supposed to speak to the rock, Moses, and you struck it, and you messed up this picture of salvation. But Moses was not a loser. He was one (laughs) who the Lord used, and quite frankly, we are not losers either. Some of us think if we die at 40, we've lost. We should have lived at 90. And yet if you're a believer— you go be with the Lord. On the Mount of Transfiguration, who shows up with Jesus? Moses, Moses and Elijah. Now, was that just a, a, an image of Moses? No. The Bible portrays it as it was Moses and Elijah. So Moses, I think, got a much better deal because after 40 years in the wilderness with people that complained constantly, <laughs> I would be ready to go too. Well, but he went to a better place. It says in Scripture that the more responsibility you are given— the more you're held accountable for that responsibility. It says, don't seek to be teachers. You're held more accountable. Mm -hmm. So the fact of the matter is, look who Moses was leading. Look at the size of his responsibility and his authority. So even a minor thing that might appear, especially with centuries past, but even at the time, why would God have punished him for that? Because he had significant authority and he abused that authority And this is what the punishment is, because he was given that kind of authority. But the good news is, who buried Moses? The Bible says God buried Moses after he died. He was still in the Lord's hands. So, yeah, we do, even as teachers of the Word, we do some stupid things that I know, I know when I get to heaven, you know, I'm going to get pulled aside. Come here, Tom, we got to talk. No, 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 they're going to get burned up. That's my goal. Yeah, Yeah, when I'm gone. (laughs) But, But the bottom line is, I don't think Moses was being punished. I think Moses made huge mistakes, but I don't think it was a direct <clears throat> excuse me, punishment. The man served the Lord through everything that I can't even imagine for 40 years, and the Lord took him home. And your point is very valid. One of the things that was not a consequence is he did not lose his, his place with God, right? So he couldn't go into the land— Uh, Joshua took his place and had to fight in the land and so on. But God obviously kept him. um, Of course. And we see him at the transfiguration and so on. So, yes. And that's the good news for us. No matter what we do, if we're believers in Jesus, he's always got his hand stretched out. He's always there for us. And we need to keep grabbing back. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
877-933-2484 to send your question over for Guy Talk. would love to hear what you have on your mind today. Here's a comment. Uh, unforgiveness can be a foothold that demons can use to get into your life. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Absolutely. Yeah, unforgiveness is a terrible thing. And we don't even, when we're in that state, we don't want to be reminded that God forgave us. <laughs> right? Right. Because we're, we're kind of wallowing in this unforgiveness because we think it's justified. So I think the, the person is absolutely right. Mm-hmm. You know, Hebrews twelve fifteen says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile. I think that when you are unforgiving, I, I always kind of picture it as this bitter root growing, and you just let it grow. And no, forgive the person and get rid of that bitter root growing up in your life. But you know, most unforgiveness is internal. We hide it. We don't necessarily, I mean, we might actually like to be around that person because they're grumpy or they're not whatever, but they hide it inside. In all the years of counseling, I found that when people would confess that openly, even argue with the Lord about it, Lord, it's not fair what they did to me. Why didn't you stop that? Why did you let this child die or whatever else? But they verbalize it and they're honest and we can pray together. I see people begin to get the power to forgive for the first time in their life because they're not holding it in it just inside anymore. They're being honest with the Lord, like King David in the Psalms, and with other Christians so they can find help. And I welcome people every time they want to do that. Mm-hmm. All right. Send your questions over 877-933-2484. It's plenty of time for your question. Guy Talk is here, ready to take your questions. We'll be right back. Musi gratis a big a buncha. You know, I took an online language course, but I will admit I couldn't afford the professional one. But I think you get the idea that in whatever language and however we try to say it, you hear from each one of us at Faith Radio that your financial gifts, prayer support, and generosity made our spring fundraiser a glory to God praise report. And you can still do so now at MyFaithRadio.com or by texting the word GIVE to 877-933-2484. Thank you. It always goes back to Jesus. That's what we were just saying during the break. <laughs> Absolutely. Tom Paris said that, and Jeff Redorn, give us Ephesians 4.32. Well, I was just talking, we should have mentioned this verse in Ephesians 4, where it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ has forgiven you. All right. Uh, here's my next question. I'll be 60 soon, and I'm not interested in retiring. Is retirement biblical? I would like to work as long as God allows I'm 74 and I have no retirement in my future at all. I will preach and teach the gospel and help people until the day I die. It depends on what the Lord's called you to do. Mm -hmm. If you're a believer, the Bible says you're a minister of reconciliation. You're an ambassador of the good Mm -hmm. news. So whether you work as a plumber or you don't have to do plumbing for the rest of your life, but you're still going to engage people with the gospel and that mission never ends. It it doesn't end. If you're talking vocation... Well, that, yeah. that can end. Yeah, sure. it can end. You mm-hmm. can retire from your vocation sure. if you've saved up enough money and want to go do whatever. But what, what you just described, Tom, are things that that a Christian is exhorted to do by God his entire life, whatever your vocation is. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right, here's my next question. I always wonder why people say that the person has gone to a better place when I always say the person has gone to the best place. Um, I was just at a funeral. It's funny because I, the, a friend of mine, her twin sister passed away and I know the mom a little bit. And in the greeting line, I hugged her and said, I'm so sorry for your loss. And she said that she went to a better place. And I said, better by far, which is exactly how Paul describes it, right? It is better by far. I, I wish I could depart and be with the Lord, which is better by far. So it is better by far. It is a better place. It is the best place. But that was just a moment that I just had a couple of weeks ago that was very special mm-hmm. to me. And it's just, it, it is better by far. All right. Will King Saul be in heaven? That's up to the Lord. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a silly or facetious I way. I expect a deeper answer, Tom Perry. I know. I know you do. I know you do. The, the I could pic- have given that answer. <laughs> <laughs> the picture at the end of Saul's life where he you know, falls on the sword and that does not look good. But at the same time, 
the Lord set him apart to be the king of Israel, the first king, now anointed by Samuel. I don't know, but the, I know the Lord will be eminently fair with King Saul, just as he's eminently fair with you and me, and none of us can ever say, hey, this wasn't fair, Lord. You didn't really give me a chance. No, he does. But whether I can say definitively one way or the other, I have no idea. I hope he's there. But only the Lord knows that one. You know, we often think that we have to have a clean slate. Then we're ready to be right. in heaven. And so is there any unconfessed sin or has I, have I done anything that I haven't revealed? And will that go ahead and stop me? We could say the same thing of Saul. Sure. I mean, he ended up going down instead of up in terms of his behavior and his character. But he, as you said, Tom, he was anointed of God. He was selected to be the king. He started off well. and But the fact of the matter is, is that aren't we all glad that we're saved regardless of what Absolutely. we're doing? And salvation, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to vote yes. And we don't know. And God's judgments are perfect, Tom, just as you said. But uh, totally agree, Greg, in the sense this. We know salvation is not based on how well we we do our job, how well we perform as king or anything for that matter. Mm-hmm. It's based on faith. Yeah. And so the question is, did he have faith? Yes, he's saved. No, he wasn't. All right, here's my next question, gentlemen. The peace lover that Jesus was... Why is it he would have his disciples carrying around swords? And I believe his capture, ultimately, one of them drawing and using it. Yeah, Peter did. And he didn't try to cut off that soldier's ear. He probably went for his head. Of course he did. And the soldier ducked a little. (laughs) I don't, I think sometimes we get this idea of Jesus being the peacemaker, is that Jesus does not really combat evil or say no to destructiveness or to confront people that are doing great evil. And yet, in the book of Revelation, the image we get of Jesus is the one coming on the white stallion with the double-edged Revelation sword. Revelation 19, yeah. And that double-edged sword, I have a double-edged sword at home, was given to me, a crusader sword. It's a replica. But hanging it on the wall, I cut my hand. Because it is so <laughs> sharp, I couldn't get over it. And I thought, I'm going to be very careful with this thing from now on, because I've got it hanging in my living room. The bottom line is, don't mess with Jesus. Yes, he is the peacemaker, but I can also tell you that being a pastor and being in downtown Minneapolis, I'm very realistic about people. I love people. I want them to know Jesus, but I'm realistic about crime. I'm realistic about people that want to rob you. I'm realistic about that. And so we put up security. You know, if if I said uh, I just want to be a peacemaker, the doors would never be locked. But we all lock our doors, yeah. even as Christians. You know, they... We love to go ahead and reflect on Jesus being the Lamb of God, but he's also the Lion of Judah. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorite images. I love that image. That's a great picture. Lion of the tribe of Judah. I think of that double-edged sword at your house, Tom. (laughs) You shouldn't try to use it to spread peanut butter on your toast. (laughs) I've learned, Bill. It's it's not been easy. You know, I bring a double-edged sword to my class sometimes, and it's about handling the Word of God. The Word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. But I will hand this sword to someone in my class and I'll say, I'll ask this question. Are you, do you think you'd be able to defend yourself using this sword? Well, it's, you know, four feet long. It's heavy. heavy. They can barely hold it up. And the answer is no, I don't think I could defend myself from anything using this sword. That's because they haven't been trained how to use it. And the word of God is the same way. The more we train in the word of God, the more we can wield it to fight the battles for truth that we encounter in our lives. And one last thing on the sword, the physical sword uh, that the question was about in the Gospels, there's no prohibition against self-defense in Scripture. Um, the, The whole turn the other cheek thing is about if someone insults you, don't insult them back. Don't repay evil with evil. But there's, I don't see anything in the New Testament that says you can't physically defend yourself from a physical attack. Yeah. Right. All right. Here's my next question, guys. When one dies, are we asleep and then we get up during the rapture or are we absent from the body present with Christ? 
Well, that that second one is an actual verse, so I'm yeah. gonna, I'm going to go with that one. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I'm going with too. The the idea of soul sleep, I just don't think is biblical. We have a couple of examples of when people die; they're actually conscious and communicating. And I'm thinking specifically of Luke 16 as one example, where Lazarus and the rich yep. man die. They go to before the cross, they would go to Hades, and they're actually communicating and talking to Father Abraham. And and uh, and so I think that is a picture that we are conscious. So when Paul says he is with the Lord, I believe him. Mm-hmm. All right. Jesus tells people no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. What about Enoch and Elijah? Did they not go into heaven? Oh, good question. I've I've never considered that. I what I just said about Hades I think applies to this because Jesus is speaking before the cross and before the cross whenever a righteous person died they went to the bosom of Abraham or the comfort side of Hades and did not go to heaven. But Elijah and Enoch were translated to heaven. So I think Jesus, what he's saying is true. It's not absolute. We do know of this exception of Elijah and Enoch. But he's saying the principle is is that nobody died and went to heaven uh, because Christ, the Lamb of God, hadn't paid for the sins of the world yet. Actually, I think it's the reason. Uh, but that doesn't preclude Elijah and Enoch. But very, very good question. And, and it doesn't mean that heaven didn't exist just because Hades did before the cross. Correct. So heaven was there. So it's God's prerogative. <laughs> he can do what he wants. Yep. <laughs> All right. Here's a comment. Descendants of Abraham physically would be Jews and Arabs. Ishmael was also his son. Modern people of Israel are called Israeli, not Israelites. Galatians talks about the the Israel of God believers. Thoughts True. So what's what's the what's the question? A, just, it's not a question. It's a comment. Right. Um, in I fact, invite comments. It, as it, well. It's. I think he's correct, or she's correct. The. She. I just. I had this conversation with somebody, and they said, "Well, Abraham was the first Jew." And it's like, "Well, okay. Well, wait a minute. Abraham was called and said, and God said that the nations of the world would be blessed from him, and he'd be the father of many nations. He had two sons." Isaac and Ishmael. And yes, the Arab populations descended from Ishmael, the Ishmaelites. And Isaac then was the father of Jacob and Esau. Esau also was the father of many of the Arab people, the Edomites and so on in scripture. Jacob is the one who became Israel. And I would argue theologically, Jacob was the first Jew or the first of Israel, along with his then 12 sons and the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, nicely done. All right. I just lost my place. All right. When the Israelites devoted to God, the other pagan nations already in the promised land, why is that not considered genocide? This is similar to the question that we were yeah, it is. discussing earlier about Israel and, and this tough story about God telling Israel to clear the land because he said if you— don't push them out of the land. Their sons will marry your daughters, and your daughters will marry their sons, and they'll cause you to fall to uh, follow false gods. Remember, we, we mentioned earlier, last hour, that these folks were particularly sinful, sacrificing their children to mm-hmm. false gods, um, satanic worshiping false gods, by the way. And uh, and so it, God knew that these people would lead his people astray, and he wanted his people to be set apart so that the nations could know. Greg, you also pointed out that God gave them 400 years to repent mm-hmm. and to turn to him. He, he wishes none to perish, and that's God's heart. Remember, what's more significant, physical death or eternal death, spiritual death? Well, of course, it's the latter. So in the end, physical life is only going to last so long, but eternal life lasts forever. And that is the death, life and death that God sets before mankind. You know, you look at these people, and I understand we're using modern language on something that happened a long time ago. Genocide is a pretty strong word to use on the Lord in that sense. But the Lord knew the people. He knew what they could do and they couldn't do. We weren't there in the sense of understanding that. The Lord could have brought a flood. The Lord could have brought a huge tornado and wiped them all out. 
he chose to use the Israelite people to push them out because I think it was a lesson for the Israelites not to intermarry and that, and it was uh, taking away uh, these people who were pretty brutal people. I don't fully understand it from a human point of view, but I do understand this, that the Lord who made the people, who were the pagans, who sacrificed their children, he still loved them, but he wouldn't tolerate the behavior anymore. And he said no. And quite frankly, folks, we have to understand, you know, we can't do the same thing today and expect the Lord not to have some judgment. We have to be serious about what Jesus has done. All right, we're going to take a little break, but that means in about 90 seconds we'll be back to hopefully answer your question, send it over, 877-933-2484. You're listening to Guy Talk. I've got Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V. as my panel. Be right back. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Let's get it started. Jump in your car. Yeah. What's for dinner? Hey. It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. It is Guy Talk, or guys who talk, and they do their very best to answer whatever questions you have. There's some great questions coming in, so thank you for your questions and also your comments. I like a good comment every now and then. Here's one. Jesus spent 40 days with people after he rose. Plenty of time to talk about what happened in Gethsemane. What Pilate said, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> what a great Good comment. Point. Yeah, what a, a great valid, comment. Valid yeah. comment. I like yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. It's a great comment. All right. Um, let's see here. Before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, what constituted someone going to heaven? Obeying the Torah law, which was impossible for humans because we're all sinners. Well, yeah. the, oh, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that uh, Paul makes it clear that uh, the law never made anything perfect. Yeah. So no one was ever saved by the law, but it actually tells us how. It says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So how is Abraham, this was pre-cross, pre-resurrection, how was he saved? By faith. It's the same faith that saves after the cross. Now, what God has revealed to us has changed. We now know of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and that's what we're called on to believe and be saved by faith. But Abraham believed what God had revealed to him, and he was therefore saved. So by faith. I often go back to Hebrews 11. That is the faith chapter, because it talks about, you know, uh, all those who believe by faith. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. What we don't understand is that faith has always been the passageway. Faith, though, is not faith in faith. I often hear people say, I just wish I had more faith. You don't need more faith. Jesus compared it to a mustard seed. It's where you put that faith. And when you put it in the person of Jesus, or as they understood who Yahweh was in the Old Testament, or the, you know, the, the one true God, and put their faith in him, they had everything they needed. And that's all we need today, is to put our faith in the right place. I think that's a strong point. Your faith is only as valid and as good as the object you place it in. Yeah. And so the question we need to ask ourselves repeatedly, what am I really putting my faith in? Yeah. Is it in Jesus Christ? In the case of Abraham, it probably took him more faith to remain a follower of God than it does somebody who had benefited from what was done on the cross. Yeah. In a sense, it took more faith. So Je righteousness. Jesus actually uses this phrase a couple of times in the New Testament, in the Gospels, mm -hmm. ye of little faith. One of those times is when Jesus is on the boat with the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee. I've, I've been on the Sea of Galilee four times. We always read this story. It's always so powerful because I love this story. And he's asleep. The winds come up, the waves come up, and all his disciples are afraid, and they wake up, Jesus, we're all going to drown. And, and you can imagine what Jesus is thinking. It's like, you think I brought you out in this boat, and I'm the creator of all this stuff just for you guys to drown in a boat? and With me in it. With me in it. <laughs> and he gets up, and he says, be still, be calm, right? Now, what he's doing, by the way, in the Psalms, it says, God is the one who calms the wind mm -hmm. and stills the waves, right? So oh, sure. what was he proclaiming? He was pro proclaiming himself that he is God. Of he's course. the one who is who made the winds. I'm the one who made the waves. And he's basically saying to his disciples, oh, you of little faith, don't you know 
who is in the boat with you? I'm the maker of the wind and the waves. Oh, you of little faith. They didn't understand what they were putting their faith in this guy. They didn't recognize who he was yet. The one time I was on the Sea of Galilee, this was in 2014, we got out to the middle and a storm came up. Oh, no now, way. first, it, when the storm is not up, you can actually see the shoreline. Yeah. All the way the around. The whole lake. Yep. But when a storm came up, we couldn't see it at all. It was frightening. I mean, the wind came up that quick. So it brought me right back to the story that you're, that you're talking about. I don't know what's wrong with me. My church never sent me to Israel or the Sea of Galilee. They sent me to jungles out there with rivers <laughs> and mud houses that I lived in the and snakes. ate food. That lots I, of snakes. Lots of snakes, <laughs> lots of tigers. And I want to thank them, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if this is a little metaphor, but whatever your life is and whatever storms you you have in your life just make sure jesus is in your boat mm. yeah, absolutely. yeah that's a great man that'll be a great message yep. well yeah is jesus in your boat <laughs> yeah all right here's my next question gentlemen god tells us to ask and to believe and it will be given but then we're also told to let it be his will with that said is it true faith knowing that god might not answer your request but that you absolutely know he can if it's his will. That's another message, and that's pretty good. Yeah, it's solid. Because mm-hmm. the confidence is in the Lord doing it, not in how much I believe in it. It's who I believe in and where I put my confidence. And I'm glad the second part of the verse was there, if it's according to his will. Too much of what I think is the Lord's will is really Tom's will. And i got to be real careful with that in terms of my relationships and the way I do things. Going back, and when we come together, my church comes together for uh, our prayer day. We pray for 90 minutes together. We've learned now we spend the first 30 minutes just in praise, doing nothing but giving praise and thanks to the Lord, because that sets the rest of the hour. And it is amazing how the prayers have changed from when we first started doing it, where everybody just prayed what they wanted to pray, because they're more in line, I believe, with the Word of God and with what the Lord's will. And we're seeing, honestly, we're seeing miracles come out of that. We're seeing things come out of it we never expected. So I like that with the Lord's will. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen, were Adam and Eve the first humans, or were there other humans on earth before them? I believe yes, and I actually think theologically it's rather important. Um, The idea that God made Adam and Eve and that they were spiritually united with him and then fell in a literal garden and were separated from God means that there needed to be a second Adam, and Jesus is actually called the second man, the second Adam, to come to redeem mankind from that fall. Um, So Adam being a literal human being, the first one, by the way, the first and literal with a literal garden and literal command and a literal fall means that we need a literal redeemer to come. It's fascinating to me. Much in Christianity believe in evolution. They think evolution is compatible with uh, Christianity. I get it. I understand the arguments. But I'd like to point out, it's kind of odd because Adam is actually talked about in the New Testament a handful of times, including the genealogy of Jesus Christ. If he's not a literal person, I don't know why you'd list him in a genealogy. So I actually think theologically it is important that Adam was the first man and that he Mm -hmm. fell, and that we need a literal redeemer to redeem us of sin. Were there beings that existed before Adam? There were. They were called angels. Hmm. And so consequently, there were in existence created beings, but not humans. I agree. I agree. All right. I think I've got time for this. Genesis 3.22, God said, Behold, the man has become like us, lest he put his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Why didn't God want them to eat from the tree of life and live forever? The tree of life is only mentioned after the fall of man. Where was it? And were Adam and Eve prohibited from eating its fruit? I, I don't think before the fall they were prohibited. I think the the short answer is that God didn't want now fallen man to eat from the tree of life and live forever in this fallen state. And I think that's where that comes from. Anybody else want to jump in on that, or is that plenty? Yes, I think 
Yeah, a lot of nods right now. A lot of, <laughs> lot of, that's plenty. Yeah, see their blood sugars dropping. I can see that. <laughs> we're waiting for the pizza at the door. No, yeah. no, that that ship is sailed. Is now it all gone? Wrong. By the way, is it all gone? Oh, yeah. is all I gone. had the last piece. You had the last piece. <laughs> yeah. Of course, that's perfect. Yeah. I knew Greg, I would never see it again. Greg, probably. Yeah. The last piece. so right, Greg. All right, <laughs> well, you're going to take a little break. and be right back. Time to answer your questions. Send it over eight seven seven nine three three two four eight four. Be right back. If you'd like to know more about what it means to begin a relationship with Christ or to chat with someone about it, just text the word FAITH to 41224. Thanks for tuning in to Guide Talk. I've got Greg B., Tom P., Jeff V., and they're here to answer your questions. Here's a question. Um, Is Job a real person, a Christophany, or just an imaginary figure for the biblical story? The Bible presents him as a real figure. <clears throat> I believe he was a real figure. I believe he really went through that. The point of the story is simply this. No matter what comes your way, you trust the Lord, and he's the one that makes our path straight. Now, beyond that, I know some people want to think it's metaphorical. Some people want to go in different directions. They don't understand how our Lord could do that and take his children away or have his children die in that, and then give him new children. I don't know how all the Lord works, but I know this, that I believe the stories in the Bible are not metaphorical. I believe they're all true stories. They're historical stories, and we get a glimpse of them. We don't get the whole, every detail of the story, but we get enough of it. And so I expect, with Job as a believer, I hope to run into him in the kingdom of God one day. There's no indication in Scripture that he wasn't a real person. And even what you mentioned, God taking, God didn't take their life. The enemy did. He sure. gave the enemy permission to do certain things up to a point. But it goes back to this whole question about eternity. I mean, you could look at it and say, well, if those children were taken, they're in a much better place right now anyway. So they benefited from it. I'm not trying to justify mm-hmm. um the comment that people feel that it was unjust, but the fact of the matter is, is that God knows what he's doing and you have to trust him for it. Yeah, there's nothing, you know, <clears throat> parables or stories typically have strong clues that says, hey, this is not a real story. Like right. the kingdom of heaven is like or whatever. There's no mm-hmm. language like that in the book of Job. Everything indicates that he's a real person. I've, I've heard the theory that, no, this has never really happened historically and so on, but uh, I think the narrative points to a literal man named Job, and this happened to. Now, the theory that he also mentioned was that, was Job a Christophany or in some way? I have not heard that one. I've taught on Christophanies and all the Christophanies that I think are in the Old Testament, Jacob wrestling with God, uh, God appears to Moses face to face, and so on. Um, Melchizedek, I think, actually was a, a Christophany. And I haven't heard that theory. I don't know I, I'm I'm just scanning the introduction to Job here, and I don't know why someone would conclude that Job was a Christophany, a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Do you guys, can you think of anything, or have you ever heard that no. idea? I, I don't think they're assuming that. I think they're just wondering. Yeah, I don't think yeah. so. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've, I've never heard anybody speak of Job as being a, a Christophany. Do you make a distinction, Jeff, between a Christophany and a Theophany? Yeah, I do. I think technically the definition of a Christophany is Christophany is an appearance of God in human form, where a theophany would be an appearance of God in a potentially non-human form in some way, shape, or form. So, like a a, a, a burning bush or whatever. So, I think that's the definition. I'm going to look it up now. And I think a lot right. of people struggle with trying to understand because we talk about our loving Lord who sacrificed Himself and did all of this. They have a hard time reconciling that with a lot of the Old Testament. And because they're caught in between, they're scratching their heads and they're saying, what's really going on here? Well, how can he behave that way back there and this way here? The point is, it is still the same Lord. He is still just. and He's still fair. We only have a portion of the story in all of these stories. We don't have the whole story in the detail. And the Lord does what was right and what was best at the time and what was for our redemption as well. Mm-hmm. All right, gentlemen, let's see. I've always been confused about where the wives of Adam's sons came from. Hmm, does Genesis 1, 26 and 27 give the answer to this? I'll read that. And it says in 26, um, 
Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and all, over the, all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So I think if you then read Genesis 2, it seems clear from the from the two chapters that God made Adam and God made Eve. They were the first man and the first woman. Eve is called the mother of all living things. So I think all men, all mankind came from Adam and Eve, number one. Number two, uh, we don't have the whole story. So when there's others that are talked about, we don't have the full account of all the children of Adam and Eve. We don't even know how long it was in between some of these stories in, in Genesis. Um, so I just... I've kind of concluded that, well, they must have had lots of other children, and they had lots of children. And remember, they lived a long time, so uh, all of these different relationships and marriages would have come from other people or other siblings, I'm sorry, descendants of Adam and Eve. I'm looking at Genesis 5 right now, and the whole chapter talks about how long these people lived, and they had multiple sons and daughters. So the population you know, went up quickly. Uh, where it all came from, we know that Adam and Eve had children after Cain and Abel. We, you know, that, that happened. It doesn't talk about how many daughters they had, or I don't think it does in any detail. Mm -hmm. But the point is, uh, it wasn't long until there were lots of people around. Even for, you know, Cain and his sinfulness, found a wife. And that does mean, by the way, that sibling would have married sibling. But I think, uh, you know, today, their DNA would have been God-made perfect DNA. And I think some of the consequences that we see today, uh, uh, mutations sure. and stuff mm -hmm. when siblings marry siblings or even first cousins marry first cousins, I think God understood that. And because their DNA was so brand new and made by God that that just wasn't an issue in the first earliest generations of man. Mm. Thank you for that, Jeff V. All right, uh, um, what last day prophecies are yet to be fulfilled before the rapture. None. Yeah, agree, none. Yeah. The next step is the rapture. Nicely done. Let the yeah. Lord come. Let him come. Come, Lord Jesus. When Amen. he says, by the way, at the end of Revelation 21, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me. I love this because soon people say, well, it's been 2,000 years. That's not soon. The Greek word there is teku, T-A-C-H-U. And it can mean soon as in a short period of time, but it can also mean suddenly, yeah, without warning, yeah. I come as a thief in the night. So Jesus says in Matthew 24, just as in the days of Noah, people were eating and drinking and giving in marriage right up until the day Noah entered the ark. Nobody knew when the flood was coming. Noah knew that the flood was coming, right. but he didn't know when it was coming. We too, as the church, we know the rapture is coming. We don't know when it's coming. But we know that it is coming. So this day will not surprise you, Paul says in Thessalonians. Why? Not because we know it's coming or there's signs for it or prophecies or whatever, but because we know that it is coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Yeah, and Noah had to wait, what, 100 plus years? I think he built the ark for 120 years, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. All right. Uh, you know, I don't know if I have enough time. Do I have enough time, Wyatt? I don't know what question you're going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think these wow. guys are happy after having pizza today? I think they've been spoiled a little bit, yeah. yeah? I think they're we very have. happy. Chris, Boy, you, Bill, has, you sure had sure. Bill is sure rubbing off on you, Wyatt. <laughs> well, yeah. No. Yeah, you had a piece yourself. I did. So It was a, excellent. It was excellent. A big thank you to Chris. Yeah. Chris, absolutely. Yep. Thank you, yes, Chris. Yes, indeed. Thank All you. Right. Um, Okay, does, does it matter what goes into our mouth? The Bible really says what matters is what comes out. So... Do we have to take care of ourselves physically? Can we whatever we want? We're stewards of our own body. And we're the temple yeah. of the Holy Spirit, and we should be doing everything we can to protect that holy temple. I agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. We should also be as equipped physically uh, to do as much good work as we can for mm -hmm. the Lord. And if you're too tired or, you know, you can't have energy to go do the work of the Lord, I think that's a mistake. Yeah. Yep. All right, gentlemen, good job today. Thank you for your, thank your outstanding thank you, Bill. Thanks, work Bill. and dedication to the show. And uh, thank you again for all these great questions and comments. Yeah, what this, a great audience we have. Yeah, yeah, they really are great. So Phenomenal. Yeah. Thank you for uh, participating. Send questions in any time. You can send them in Tuesday at 2 in the afternoon. 
uh, and just say, this is for Guide Talk. And we'll just gather them and answer them on Thursdays. All right. Have a great night. I don't know what you have planned tonight, but I pray blessings upon you and your time with the Lord. And I hope you really get a good night's sleep. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.